what's the biggest PR disaster you've ever seen? Back in the 1990s, Hoover, then the biggest vacuum cleaner company in the UK and many other markets, made the biggest PR misstep I've ever seen. The business need was that they had a load of old stock of vacuums and washing machines that needed shifting. So, rather than aggressively cutting prices which could undermine the amount of money people would be willing to pay for such a product in the future, they went for a classic solution, a sales promotion. That was the right call, but what happened next was a complete train wreck. The sales promotion was that if you spent more than £100 on a Hoover product, you would receive two free return airline tickets to any destination in Europe. A very generous deal, but given it would free up costly warehouse space and they could buy cheap airline tickets in bulk, Hoover was confident that they could run the promotion and still make money. Wrong. The problem Hoover ran into is that huge numbers of people went out and bought a Hoover product just because they wanted the airline tickets. People were buying new vacuums and washing machines because they calculated that it was cheaper than simply buying their holiday flights. The company quickly found itself totally overwhelmed by the demand both for tickets and products, and this also ruined their math. They were now making a huge loss on every product sold. However, for a time, they didn't realize this. They instead saw a huge boom in sales and revenue without realizing every sale came with a commitment to invest in expensive airline tickets. As a result, the business decided to expand the promotion to include new long-distance destinations like the USA. This double-down decision is perhaps the worst double-down decision in the history of marketing in the UK. By the time they realized what was actually happening, it was too late. The promotion has no real terms and conditions and so Hoover were unable to protect themselves. As long as the in-store promo messages remain, people expected to get the deal. The huge run on products and thus airline tickets totally swamped the company in administrative pain and financial disaster. In the end, the company was taken to court many, many times for broken promises and unfulfilled claims. The courts ruled against them in every case as the promotion clearly guaranteed tickets with purchase. It was not a competition. The final result was an estimated loss of £50 million and the firing of a number of board directors. No surprises that the CMO was among them. The ongoing damage to the company and the brand was so big, they were sold just a few years later at a cut-down price to an Italian company, and the Hoover brand in Europe has never been the same since. Damn, I remember those days. The Hoover we just got is like the best vacuum I've ever purchased. It is like a graphic designer and engineer had a beautiful mechanical baby. Now, I'm not from Hoover, but I would like two free return airline tickets for defending the company, if that's possible, still. Story 2. Two years ago, the Pittsburgh Penguins decided to do a Q&A session on X involving James Neal, a skilled player with, well, let's say that he's not exactly known for fair play. He has a history of borderline and outright dirty play, including cross-checking opponents in the face, elbowing them in the head, and also an incident of kneeing an opponent in the head. Sample questions from various hockey fans. James, do you get the biggest thrill out of kneeing someone in the head or cross-checking them in the head? Do you make rocket noises when you launch yourself at people's heads? If not, why? Do you think before cross-checking people in the head or is it just pure instinct? If you open a bar, how cheap would your shots be? What part of the stick should I be holding to really lay a good cross-check to someone's head? If a tree falls down in the forest and nobody is around to hear it, does James Neal still cross-check it in the face? What favorite memory have you robbed from one of the players you need to the head? A train leaves NYC traveling at 97 miles per hour. Another train leaves LA traveling at 76 miles per hour. When do you the child riding coach? If you could go back in time and play with any player in the history, which one would you knee in the face? If the moon was made of barbecue spare ribs, would you still leave your feet to charge at it? And when you go into a corner and there are three people and you only have two elbows, how do you decide which one gets kneed? Story 3. The reign of former United CEO Jeff Schmesk. First, he was there for the merger of United and Continental, but never merged the contracts for the pilots and flight attendants, leaving the entire staff disliking the guy. He's also blamed for taking people's pensions and making a bunch of people relocate to Chicago and then laying them off. Second, on top of that, at the beginning of every flight, he would have a video of himself talking about how great UA is. The comments from the flight attendants are hilarious. Next, he started cheapening the food in international and first-class business. 
My favorite is their old champagne, Chateau de Jeff. Fourth, Jeff lied to Cleveland and closed their hub anyways. This was a big reason the United merger was approved. Fifth, one of Jeff's underlings was caught trashing elite members, which caused a lot of very high-frequency flyers to leave. And finally, Jeff finally got fired for bribing some guy in Jersey. He got fired and paid like $10 million. It's good to be Jeff. Oh, and some guy was the chairman of the Jersey Port Authority. The bribe involved setting up a flight for him, nicknamed Chairman's Flight, between Newark and his summer home in Columbia, SC. The flights never filled up and United lost an estimated $10,000 per week on this. The flights ran for well over a year. The severance package was not $10 million, it was over $36 million. This wasn't as much of a PR disaster as one might think though, at least not in the juicy revelation causes someone or a company to implode. Rather, his reign led to a long decline of United in many metrics. Staff morale, lots of frequent flyers jumping ship, a massive devaluation and reduction in frequent flyer program, hard and soft product. However, Wall Street really liked United, which was making lots of money through ancillary revenue. Read, charging you for everything extra. So what happened after? United got a new CEO, Oscar Munoz, who at this stage is well-liked by pilots, flight attendants, and flyers alike. However, he had a massive heart attack within a few months of taking the helm. After a short stint in the hospital too, I kid you not, have his heart replaced, he's now back at work. Story 4. Here's a few. First, the Swedish PR firm Locum spelled their name without a capital L and with a heart instead of a no. Second, that Starbucks campaign where they made the baristas have conversations about race with their customers. Third, the Union Street Guest House Hotel threatened to levy a $500 fine against customers who left a negative Yelp review. Then the internet found out. Hundreds of people proceeded to spam their Yelp page with negative reviews. They're no longer in business. Next, when the game Burnout 2 or 3 came out, the game was big about driving on the wrong side of the road, crashing, and general law breaking. So they had a campaign where you could send in your speeding tickets and they would pay them for you. Oh boy, did the police get annoyed at that one. Fifth, probably Mars Ice Cream, a couple of decades ago in the UK. They planned an entire month's summer campaign on Capital Radio starting in June. When the trigger temperature reached 21 degrees Celsius, all these promotions, competitions, giveaways, etc. would kick off. So the Capital DJs were announcing the imminent start of the great ice cream event, and it was cold and rainy for week after week after week. In fact, the mercury stayed stubbornly below 21 degrees for the entire time the campaign was supposed to run, and it never kicked off at all. Moral, don't rely on the British weather as the linchpin of anything. Sixth, a Philadelphia pretzel shop opened up in our neighborhood and thought it would be funny to hand out marketing and advertisement papers that look like a Philly parking tickets on one side. So the neighborhood woke up to find their cars littered with tickets and everyone had a meltdown of rage. People stormed over to their car, ripping the ticket out of their windshield, only to find out it was a joke. The other side was an advert to the new pretzel shop, and man, did that shop get it. Calls, threats, screams, you name it. I don't know how they stayed in business, but it was a rocky start. And for anyone not familiar with the region, the area this happened in has overly crowded street parking. So people are already super stressed out about parking cars, too limited parking places, etc. Targeting the parking situation was a bad, bad move. Any other joke would have been fun. Seventh, Nestle had a promotion five years back where in every 12-pack, they had a coupon for a free 12-pack. As soon as the kids in my town caught wind of it, they brought as many cars as possible and just bought six cases, dumped them in their car, took the coupons, got six more cases, and so on. Nestle is my favorite drink of all time, so as soon as I heard about it, maybe four hours in, I checked every major store and they were clean out. I eventually found a bunch of diet Nesties in a random shop and still made a decent haul. People got creative with the literal hundreds of cans of Nesty. I built a throne. Still can't believe this crap actually happens. Eighth, last year Nestle tried to make an hashtag ask Nestle hashtag happen on X in Germany. The questions they received included, why are you letting children starve? Why do you support child labor? And why do you hate the rainforest? Guess that didn't turn out too well for them. Ninth, in 1993, Pepsi ran a contest in the Philippines promising 1 million pesos, about $40,000, to whoever found the number 349 on their bottle cap. But they accidentally made 800,000 winning caps. 
The mistake led to death threats against Pepsi executives and nationwide outrage. Tenth, Martha Coakley ran against Scott Brown for Ted Kennedy's old Senate seat. After being criticized for not running an enthusiastic enough campaign as Brown continued to close the gap between them, she responded, What do they want? Me outside Fenway Park shaking hands in the cold? A shot at Brown who was doing that very thing a few days before. She proceeded to lose the election and Massachusetts had its first Republican senator since 1979. Eleventh, a chain of opticians in the Edinburgh area called Browns decided to rebrand to Brown Eye Specialists. Rebranded all the shop fronts too, with the words brown eye being the most prominent. They've now gone back to Brown's opticians. Twelfth, there is this department store in Brazil that had put in their TV ads, buy anything you want for the price you want, and some guy decided to buy a bunch of expensive stuff and said he was willing to pay only one dollar. The store said he couldn't, and then he proceeded to sue the company and eventually won the lawsuit. They removed it from TV. That last one, it's like reverse Pawn Stars. Oh, you have a 55-inch TV in stock? Let me call in a buddy that's an expert in 55-inch TVs. Later, all right, so it's legit, but I got to make a profit. Best I can do is a dollar. If you yourself would have bought the company, then please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. It really does help me out. Now let's go ahead and get back to these PR disaster stories. Story 5. Gerald Ratner. It's a well-known story, but I'll tell it for those who haven't heard it before. He owned a chain of mass market jewelers in the UK and in 1991 got up on stage in front of a crowd of other businessmen and said, We also do cut glass sherry decanters complete with six glasses on a silver plated tray that your butler can serve you drinks on, all for 4.95 pounds. People say, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. He then said that earrings the company were selling were as cheap as a prawn sandwich, but that the sandwich would probably last longer. It should be said for context that the chain wasn't exactly renowned for quality. People knew that what they were buying wasn't particularly good quality, but Ratner almost appeared to mock his own customers. Customers then ditched the chain en masse, losing Ratner millions of pounds, and the business almost collapsed. It survives to this day as H. Samuel and Ernest Jones. Story 6 I thought of one, the launch of SimCity, the recent remake. So they decided on some horrible combination of DRM and online-only play. Cut to launch day when the servers were jam-packed and everyone was getting LOL, you can't join the server messages, but couldn't even play the game as a sandbox because it had to be online-only at the time if they could even get on to get past the DRM. EA eventually got it under control, but only after a lot of people abandoned the game and eventually they had to put it in a sandbox mode so people could play the damn game without being tethered all the time. And again, it's SimCity, not World of Warcraft. Their dreams of some MMORPG-style version of the game were widely far from what most people that I know of wanted from the game. There were numerous balls dropped with SimCity. I'm not sad the game failed, but seeing Maxis go under was upsetting because of their long history of great titles. During the Maxis AMA, posters were openly criticizing the decision to go with DRM and always online requirements, but the developers were absolutely tone deaf and ignored their fans. All these posts bemoaning always online doesn't do justice to the fact that gameplay was absolutely terrible when you could actually play it. Every mechanic was broken or bodged, mostly thanks to a laughably fragile glass box agent system. Two of my favorite examples. First, every single sim took the shortest route to work, hundreds of cars ignoring highways in favor of tiny dirt roads. If I recall correctly, traffic jams could be caused by invisible agents carrying electricity to home because they shared the road space with cars. In addition, everything that makes a functioning metropolis was absent from the road networks. No one-way roads, no metro, no ability to build overpasses if I recall correctly, i.e. the whole road network exists at ground level only. Second, Sims would wake up and find employment by selecting the nearest vacant workplace and then making a beeline for it. If it was full, by the time they arrived, they would go to the next empty building. Every morning, Sims would start a new job in a new location, and at the end of the day, the reverse happened. Sims would leave work and head for the nearest empty house, working down the streets until they found a vacant house to sleep in. Not to mention the laughably tiny cities and the stream of lies from the community manager about server-side calculations and population fudging. The first free DLC for the game was a car dealership for the Nissan Leaf electric car. 
After taking a steaming dump on decades of city building pedigree, EA gives you an advert to place in your 2 kilometer square sandbox. The game was patched monthly for a whole year and it was still hot garbage. The only thing I'm not mad about is that I never bought the game, bailing on my pre-order a month in advance. Also, no functional mod support, spitting in the face of armies of modders and asset artists that kept SC4 relevant, and generating sales for 10 strong years. What were they thinking? Story 7. Amy's Baking Company. I can't believe I forgot this one, though I'm not sure if PR disaster or PR magic actually applies. I still rewatch the Kitchen Nightmares episode from time to time. I'm not proud. But just the balls to the wall craziness and Gordon Ramsay of all people being the sane man, it's astounding and has incredible rewatch value. It always felt like something weird was going on behind the scenes that wasn't exactly a baking company with Sammy's I am the gangster quotes and all that. So I'm not sure they really had a loss there either. Funny thing is that she was convicted of fraud under another name before the ABC saga. Amy had served time in prison for misuse of a social security number. Sam had served prison time on substance and intimidation charges overseas and had been banned from France and Germany. Wow, I couldn't even finish that episode. The level of unprofessional behavior was like mind-blowing. How do they stay afloat as long as they did? Story 8. Brock Turner's Family Brock Turner's case is bad from the start, caught red-handed and still manages to get off with a comparatively light sentence. There's a local backlash against the judge based on the sentence. If I was the PR guy there, I would start talking. He was drunk, he's still learning to deal with alcohol, he screwed up but promises to do better in life. Get him to write a letter of apology, etc. Anything to get the attention off the crime and the sentence, and on something else. Ideally a program to prevent young men from making the same mistakes he did. Basically, push the young drunk victim of society, let's fix society angle. Instead, his family comes out with letters with lines like six months for five minutes of action and how scarred he is from the ordeal in the middle of a national news cycle that is focusing on the problem of what he did on campuses nationwide. And at that point, it's way too easy for everyone to compare what he's going through to what the average survivor deals with and it's entirely possible that he's going to have a hard time in life even after he's out because of what his name means now. Though I found his father's statement to be atrocious, I thought the mother's statement was absolutely vile. This has been so awful for me, I can't even decorate my house anymore. That whole family can just go to hell. Story 9 I don't know if we have any wrestling fans here, but the way the WWE handled the Chris Benoit fiasco was pretty insane. On the weekend of June 22, 2007, professional wrestler Chris Benoit did something really gruesome. Benoit, a longtime, widely respected veteran of the business, had told the WWE that he needed to go home because of his son. He missed three house shows. He ended them over the course of the weekend and took his own life at the end of the weekend. Benoit reached out to friends to be discovered after the deaths upon taking his own life and eventually was discovered by cops on the 25th the following Monday. The WWE found out that Monday, around 4 p.m., and this is when this story gets crazy. Now, at this time, one of the big WWE stories was that the week before on Monday Night Raw, Vince McMahon had been blown up and ended at the tail end of the broadcast. The show on the 25th was going to be a KFAB memorial show in honor of Vince McMahon. Immediately after finding out about Benoit on the 25th, the WWE and McMahon decided to break character and host a tribute-slash-memorial show to Chris Benoit. The WWE was not aware of what it actually was. Shortly after the three-hour program dedicated to Benoit and what he meant to the wrestling community, it came out what had really happened and the WWE moved as quickly as possible to distance themselves from Benoit and scrub him from their history. It was madness. Story 10 I remember there was a PR guy who did a press conference for a new computer when that was a big deal. After praising the heck out of the current model, he uttered the words, and next year's model will be even better. So the buying public decided to wait for next year's model, which never came because there were no profits from the current year. Story 11. The GTX 970. At first, people were wondering why the GTX 970 started to give them degraded performance in titles that use more than 3.5 gigabytes of VRAM. People thought that NVIDIA just made a mistake and that a software update would magically solve the problem. Nope. Turns out that GTX 970 has two blocks of memory, one being 3.5 gigabytes of fast VRAM 
and the other 512 megabytes of the 4 gigabyte VRAM was a lot slower, about one-fifth the speed. This was a huge shock because all those people who bought GTX 970s for an SLI config to completely crush 1440p and 2160p 4K titles basically got swindled. The GTX 970 is very good, but only in the first 3.5 gigabytes. After that, you're basically crap out of luck. Apparently, there was a miscommunication between the PR and the development department, and NVIDIA as a company got burned hard for it. They ended up settling for paying $30 to every GTX 970 owner on the lawsuit, and yeah, NVIDIA definitely screwed up on the GTX 970 because it was literally one of the most widely used cards for its price bracket. Story 12. McDonald's and their Olympics promotion in the 80s? It was kind of like their Monopoly game. You'd buy an item, it would have a peel-off tag with an Olympic event. If the US won a medal in that event, the tag would entitle you to a free item depending on the medal won. The problem is that they calculated medal winnings based on the last Olympics the US participated in in 1976, in which Soviet countries and America all competed. The U.S. boycotted the 1980 games in Moscow, but McDonald's didn't account for Soviet countries boycotting the 1984 games in Los Angeles. Without the Soviet competition, the U.S. dominated a lot of events and McDonald's was on the hook for way more free items than they thought. The Simpsons spoofed the whole thing with Krusty Burger running a similar promotion. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and all these crazy PR stories. If you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy the next one. What's the biggest F up you made that was fixed before anyone knew? Story 5 was madly crazy. I'll see you in that video and thank you for watching this one.